It's hard to look at a city like Nashville or Middle Tennessee and imagine there's heartbreak, there's longing, there's loneliness, there's fears, there are, there are people that are hurting, but that's really all over. There are people whose dreams have died right before their eyes and they need resurrection. That happens through Jesus Christ. Amen? It really, really does. My wife, Lindy, is here, and, and uh, uh, she was born and raised here in Nashville, and uh, we met in college at UT Martin. I love you, Pastor. I, um, there are a lot of pastors I don't like, but th- no, I'm just kidding. I'm just, playing. I'm, just, I'm just playing, but I do love you, Pastor. I love his heart, love his vision, and uh, lo- love the fact that he's part of our uh, system, and what a great man of God. What a great anointing you have in this church. Your music, uh, was your, your worship is touching the throne room of glory. And I thank God for your worship leader and, and the folks that have led us into the secret place, into the presence of Almighty God. Last night, Tennessee won. And so as we, no, I'm just playing. I, <laughs> I played, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, Lindy and I, we were in Martin, Tennessee. We pastored there for 22 years. I went to school there. And, uh, and then we, I used to be in hotel business, transitioned back into ministry. God called us to ministry. And so we found ourselves back in Martin where we graduated after we joined Holiday Inn in several areas. And then we came back. I played football for UT Martin. I was a kicker for two and a half years. Now with my size, people thought I was the water boy, but I, I, I enjoyed, uh, really I did. I, I, so uh, yesterday, uh, uh, my brother was wanted to go watch the game, Alabama and Tennessee, and I like both. I'm, I'm not being pol- political. I really like both, but I'm a Tennessee fan. But anyway, uh, so anyway, we, my brother was looking for tickets, and the tickets were like, you can get one way up there in the nosebleed for $368, or you can get one closer for $1,800. And so I thought, well, I'm going to watch it on TV. I'm not, of course, I'm not going to pay, not even 300 200 I'm not going to do that. And so anyway, but now next week, UT Martin, where I played football, is playing Tennessee. And the tickets are 35 bucks. I'm going. <laughs> I am going. <laughs> so, no, I'm just kidding. So we, uh, Linda and I had the privilege, the wonderful privilege of really... Uh, Pastor in Northwest Tennessee. Love being part of the Brentwood system. Love the vision. Love the fact that we're able to come alongside pastors, visionaries, churches that are saying, we believe God has a special anointing for the hour. We want to be part of that. In Northwest Tennessee, I'm not a big fisherman. Uh, I love fishing, but I'm not a good fisherman. But the men, I remember our first fishing retreat with the men. We went out to Paris Landing. Anybody know where Paris Landing is? Went out to Paris Landing. And uh, we were fishing. We came back. We didn't want to cook the fish that day. We want to cook it the next day. And so they said, we're going to go out in a restaurant tonight. So we went out to Big Sandy. Uh, anybody know where Big Sandy is? I mean, Big Sandy? One and a half person. So anyway, so Big Sandy. Get to a restaurant. And so you can about just imagine. I'm, I'm surrounded by Buford and Bubba and Buddy and all of these people. And I'm, I'm just there. So the, the waitress is taking our order. And she's coming in and... She comes in and she's trying to do an individual bill. So, what's your name? My name is Johnny. Johnny, what do you want to drink? I'll take water with lemon sugar. All right, what about you? I'm, my name is Chuck. I mean, Scott. Scott, what do you want? My, well, I'll take a sweet tea with lemon sugar. And I said, what's your name? Bubba. Bubba, what would you want? And so, I don't want And Buford, what do you want? No, no, no. And she gets to me and she, her head is down. What, you, what do you want, sir? And I say, I want water with lemon. What's your name? My name is Fadi. What? <laughs> your name is what? I said, my name is Fadi. Who? I said, Fadi. She goes, how do you spell that? I said, F-A-D-Y. She said, what? I said, Chuck, call me Chuck. <laughs> so from that moment, I became Chuck the Tennessean. <laughs> For everywhere I go, people call me Chuck the Tennessean. You know, just anyway. But do you have your Bibles with you today? Do you have the precious, glorious, living, speaking word of God on you today, whether it be in person or on the phone or however you have it. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to read in a moment verses 41 through 44. Now, I have a southern Syrian accent. I'll try my best to speak as slow as possible, and then you listen as fast, and then we'll try to get through in the next 55 minutes. So hang in there with me, and uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get through it very quickly. Now, I'm, I'll be dealing with the whole chapter of chapter 19. 
And in a moment, I'm going to read verses 41 through 44. Would you stand with me in honor of the living, speaking, glorious word of God? Amen? Amen. Verse 41, Jesus is grieving. Jesus is overwhelmed. Jesus is sobbing. He's feeling something as heavy as the burden of an entire nation. And he says something he probably didn't want to say. And here's what he said. As he approached and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you knew this day what would bring peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build an embankment against you, surround you, and hem you on every side. They will crush you and your children within you to the ground. Now, can you imagine when he said that the pain coming out of his soul? And then he said, and they will not leave one stone on another in you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So Father, just look up here for just a second. Father, would you etch this word into our minds? Would you impress it on our hearts so your burden can become our burden and it becomes application in our soul in Jesus' name? Amen. You may be seated. This is one of the most really remarkable but yet tragic events that takes place in the ministry, in the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the journey of God on earth, the incarnate God, almighty God. It's a tragic event. All four gospels record this happening right up here. And you can notice immediately when you read through this triumphal entry, the tragic triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into Jerusalem, you'll notice a lot of uncommon things in this chapter. Read it. When you go home, engage it with your mind, engage it with your emotions, because you really can't skip out of this chapter without your feelings just being touched, without your emotions being really affected, without your mind just imagining yourself as part of the journey. This is what I want you to do today. Come with me. Let's go to Jerusalem together. I want you to engage it. But I also want you to know that our Lord Jesus Christ, in most of his happenings, he has never sought public notice. Or popularity. He never did. He never did. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 12, 19. Speaking of the Messiah, Isaiah quotes, he says, He did not cry nor strive nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. In other words, he never sought attention. He never really wanted attraction. That's what that scripture is saying because it's the anointing of God that takes us into the root of a city of a nation in order that awakening may happen. It doesn't have to be via events and it doesn't have to be via large gatherings. It's when the king comes in and the spirit leads Something changes in that city. Matter of fact, Jesus oftentimes when he, when he, when he was, would speak to his disciples in Matthew 16, he said, don't tell anyone that I am Jesus the Christ. Yet, don't. When they came down from Mount Transfiguration, he spoke to his disciples. He said, I ask you to not tell of what you have seen and what you've heard until I've risen from the dead. Until it's come out. Then how do you? How do you make sense of this public happenings where Jesus initiates a journey? He literally initiates a movement. He, he initiates a, a, a procession, if you will, right into Jerusalem. And it's so, so unusual type of a procession. How do, you, how do you make sense out of that when he has never sought public office or public acknowledgement? When they came to make him king by force, he said, "My not right now, my time has not yet come. When his own family came and said, why don't you just speak of your ministry public? Just go public with your ministry. And he said, my time and my seasons have not yet come. Then how do you? literally make sense out of this. What is Jesus trying to really display for all of us at a time when he's coming when two million people are gathered around Jerusalem. They've got their tents kind of pitched toward Jerusalem. The opening of each tent of the gathering would be toward the Temple Mount so they can wake up in the morning. 
immediately into prayer time, looking into the heart of Jerusalem. Uh, how do you make sense out of that? And he knows there's a large gathering. And what would he display? We know for a fact that in this encounter from beginning in Luke 19 and, Ga- and going forward to the end of that chapter, we know that God displays his deity. This is the time. This is the time when the Father, Son, Holy Spirit said, during this Passover season, this is one of the most important popular event all throughout the year. This is the time when thousands of lambs being sacrificed. This is the time when the Lamb of God becomes the ultimate Lamb of sacrifice. The time has come when deity is displayed. And the redemption plan of God is about to unfold. And Christ himself is embracing his cross. He said, my time in few days will be coming where I will die for all of humanity. His deity is on display. Not only that, but his omniscience is on display. His coming through this procession is the fulfillment of many prophecies that says, Christ knew the word and the scriptures in the past. What's been mentioned in Daniel, mentioned in Daniel what's been mentioned in Zechariah and Jeremiah and other places and the book of Psalms. And what's going to happen in few days? His omniscience is about to be seen. His authority is about to display as well because only God can order the giving of an animal without saying please. (laughs) Only God can come say to a man, give up your ass, your animal, because the Lord has need of him. God may come to you today without saying please because he does have a perfect plan and he may say I need your house and I need your resources I need your gifts I need what I've put in you I've given you all things that pertains to life and godliness now I want to use your life for my glory and he won't say please it's because he has a beautiful perfect compassionate glorious plan for you and for others that are in touch with you this is an unbelievable happening right up here This is a day full of emotions. The day starts quietly. It's quiet journey for Jesus and his disciples coming right into Jerusalem. And then then all of a sudden there's celebration. There's emotions. There are people out there that are really engaged in this procession. And and then then everything changes. And there's also hatred. There's malice. There's envy. All because of the celebration. You're really too... Get the feel of this story you got to engage in. I want to give you four quick things. Number one, I want to take you to the place where this is happening. And then I want to take you to the procession so you can be part of it. And then I want to take you to the plea. And you watch the people pleading with God. And then I want to take you to the perfect plan of God. First, the place. The place is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. What a beautiful, beautiful city. The city of peace. No, no. There's really not peace in Jerusalem. So the Bible says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There hadn't been peace even since that day in Jerusalem. That city. But Jerusalem was like a nightlight in a bowl. Jerusalem sits on a hill. And then when you come out of Jerusalem, there are, there are several hills that surround Jerusalem. A ring of hills or mountains that surround Jerusalem. And the highest of all is Mount Olives. Right? So you've got Jerusalem here, you've got Mount Olives up here. And between Mount Olives where Jesus is going to be looking right into Jerusalem and weeps. When you come down from Mount Olives, you're going you're gonna to go through Gethsemane. You're going to go through the, the Kidron Valley. You're going to go through the Golden Gate to get right into the heart of Jerusalem. On the other side of the mountain, uh, Mount Olives, when you come down from Mount Olives, right on the other edge of Mount Olives, there is two villages you're familiar with. Bethany and Bethphage. Bethphage is where the, where the animal was that Jesus fetched so he can ride. And Bethany is a place where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived. And Jesus loved to make that home. He felt welcome, beloved, and he felt that he was accepted there. So there they are in those places. And the journey starts a little bit further than Bethany and Bethphage. It starts right at Jericho. It really was more like a desert land. And as Jesus is approaching Jerusalem... He's he's walking at this moment, at this time, everything is usual. The disciples don't know that anything other than we're all going to Passover week to participate in the activities. And Jesus comes in. And as he comes in, he goes right up to Mount Olives and then he stops. There at Mount Olives, there he he had already asked the disciples, go fetch me an animal that has never been ridden before. He comes in riding 
on a donkey. Comes in riding on a donkey. There around Jerusalem, there are over about 2 million people to celebrate the Passover week that week. And the people had only one question that day. Will he come? Will the greatest prophet of all time come? Will the prophet like Moses come? Will this king-like personality come? Especially those that were from Galilee, from the north. Those are the people that were very attracted to Jesus' ministry. See, Jesus was not popular in the south where the Pharisees and the rabbis and, and the Sadducees were having their quarters and centers. He was more popular with the common man in the north. And the people of the north were there and they're asking the question, will he come? Will he finally become king? Will he finally get rid of the internal strife between north and south? Will he finally unite the nation? Will he finally overcome our long-hated enemy, the Romans? Will he come? Will he come and rid us of all of our heavy burdens? And as he stands there on, and as he rides over, over Mount Olives, will he even camp with us and be part of us? He's coming down. Now the disciples... Before they got the animal, they had no idea what's on Jesus' mind until he said, I'm going to ride. You're going to what? I'm going to ride. I'm going to ride into Jerusalem. Then everything shifted. See, Jesus has never ridden anywhere into another city. Normally when you came into Jerusalem riding, you did because you were a conqueror. You're a military general. You were somebody who was overcome and you're showing your might and power. And so you would come in and you're, you're coming in riding on a white horse. It happened in 1904 when the Germans and the Turks got together and destroyed Jerusalem. And the, and, and the German chancellors and the German military conquerors and the Turkish came riding into Jerusalem on white horses. It happened again in 1917 when, 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 when another British German, uh, when another British uh, officer, um, a military conqueror came into Jerusalem, but he was a believer and recognized what Revelations, or the book of Revelation said that eventually the Christ will come back again on a white horse. So he dismounted from his horse, took off his hat, and walked right into Jerusalem. Anybody that came into Jerusalem, they came in as a conqueror. They came in to reign and to rule and to drive someone out of Jerusalem. And the people are watching. Jesus said, I'm going to ride. This time into Jerusalem, I will ride. And the disciples begin to think, there's something special on his mind. He's, he's coming to ride. Maybe, maybe the prophet is going to finally become the priest. And the priest is finally is going to become a king. And the Messiah, prophet, priest, and king is going to reveal himself to all humanity. And the throne of David is no longer be empty. And we will have the son of David on the throne. And Israel once more will become a conquering nation, an extending nation, a nation that no one can compete with. And he comes in into Jerusalem, and as he comes in into riding on a donkey, sad, because everybody took notice of what he said, but nobody took notice of what he did. He didn't ask for a camel or a horse. He asked for a donkey. You don't ride on donkeys into battles. Donkeys are, are animals of burden. They just, uh, you, they're, they're, you carry things. But if you're here to fight and to deliver, friend, I'm going to tell you, you don't ride on a donkey. You ask for a horse. You come in as a con They paid attention to what Jesus said, but never paid attention to what he did. You know why? They didn't know their Bible. We often miss the move of the Holy Spirit because we don't know what the Word of God is saying. We miss our revival because we don't know our Bible. And they didn't know their Bible. So we see the place and then we see the royal procession. And Jesus is prophetically here to fulfill what the Word of God said. That Messiah will come. Zechariah 9.9 said that he spoke in the prophecy of how Messiah will come through the royal procession. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Your king will come riding meek, lowly on an ass. They didn't know the word that have predicted 
the coming of Messiah, such as he was coming in, ran into Jerusalem. They missed it. They missed it. They missed the prophecy when he came in and ran right into the temple to clean up the temple, which was supposed to be the quietest place in all of Jerusalem. It was supposed to be a house of prayer. And he comes in and, and in fulfillment of Psalm 69, 9 and, and Jeremiah, he comes in and cleaned the temple from what they've made out of it. They did not know this is what Messiah do, does. He's in the right place. He's, he's in the right procession, but they missed it. Maybe because that's what happened in Acts chapter 2 when the whole Pharisaic system was watching a stir and a movement all around Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit came down in power and the glory of God was demonstrated. And thousands come to Christ and that religious system said, oh, they were acting like they're drunk. Maybe they're drunken early in the morning. They're drunk with the Holy Spirit of God. My people die for lack of knowledge, the Word of God said. He's coming in and he's coming in as a royal king and a royal Messiah and they missed it. As a matter of fact, he's coming in and the people are taking notice and the crowd wants now, now they're saying, oh, it's happening. What we've told our children decade after decade is happening. We've been waiting for almost 2,000 years since we had a king and now here is happening. As a matter of fact, they used to greet one another year after year during the Passover. If he doesn't come this year riding, I'll see you next year. Next year in Jerusalem. They anticipated every, they will tell their children, don't give up the hope that Messiah may come. They were waiting on their king. And there he comes. What are they waiting on? They're waiting on a king like David. They haven't had, they haven't had a king like David since he occupied the throne. David, who brought peace to the land. David, who brought prosperity to the land. David, the giant killer. David, who would take his instrument and bring the whole nation and they would sit and worship and connect with the Yahweh God. They haven't had peace since David. As a matter of fact, since the reign of David, their nation has been overrun. Jerusalem has been overrun by Syrians, by, by Babylonians. It's been overrun by, by, by uh, uh, Assyrians and Persians. It's been overrun by Greeks and Romans. And, and, and they haven't had peace since then. They haven't had freedom since then. They have not had prosperity since then. And here he comes. Well, of course, David is a great king. And of course, you, why would you not want to have Jesus as a great king? And he's the miracle worker. He's, he's the king who could raise the dead. He's the king who would bring bread from heaven. He's the king who is the, 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 the fire, the evangelist. He's the king who is the wheel turning. He is the king who can do things that no other prophet can. Why would you not want to have Jesus as a king? See, the place is Jerusalem, right on time. The procession, the king, right on time. And then I want you to see the plea. The plea. They see him coming. And then they go, Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. They begin to sing and cry out. They begin to take palm leaves and put it under, under the animal. They take their clothes off and, and put it so the animal can ride on it. The last time... They put palm leaves. You know how long it takes to get palm leaves to grow on a tree? It takes a long, long time. They bankrupted the trees to bring the palm leaves into the ground. The last time they laid palm leaves on the ground is when Simon the Maccabeus, a hundred years before Jesus came, was coming into the city to free the city from the Grecians. And it only lasted freedom 15 years. The last time they put their clothes under an animal, they do it only for royalty, only for king, is when Jehu came riding into Jerusalem furiously to drive out the enemies of Israel. This was the last time they did that, long time ago. And now it's happening. And they're pleading with God, save us. <laughs> save us. Our king is here. Now violence can disappear from the street. Now the throne of David will no longer be vacant. Now the cruel punishment of a hated enemy can come to an end. Save us. See, they, they're not just praising God, they're pleading with God. This is a prayer. It's not just praise, they're pleading. Do it. The word Hosanna means save now. Do it now, Jesus. Save us now. Rescue us 
Now, do you hear the cry of a million eight hundred thousand people in Middle Tennessee? Come to me. Save me. Rescue me. This is not a campaign we're after. We recognize Middle Tennessee is becoming the place of the unengaged and unchurched. And they're crying out. It's a beautiful city with a lot of empty hearts inside of their houses. Save us. We want God to bless us. We want God to come to us. We want him to bless us, but don't be the Lord of our nation. We want God to bless our abomination, but don't be the God that directs our will. The church wants to be back in business, but the church doesn't want to get out of business to be back in ministry. And we've got people in their homes waiting on you and I to come. And the king is coming. They're crying, save us. They've waited so long. They're chanting right now. The very thing they chanted when he was born. When he was born, they said, glory to God in the highest. Goodwill on earth and peace in heaven. Uh, peace on earth and goodwill to man. Now they reversed it and they're saying, glory to God on earth and peace in heaven. <laughs> because the king is here. Save us. But Jesus is weeping. Jesus is crying. What is wrong, Jesus? Aren't you happy? Millions of people are crying out before you. Hosanna to the son of David. It's the right place. It's the right procession. It's royal. It's the right plea from a nation that needed a safe king and a peaceful king. Is Jesus not happy with that? Jesus is grieving. Therefore, verses 141 to 44. We've got to get used to the idea, friends, that sometimes what we think is something exciting. It may bring tears to the heart of God. We got to get used to the idea that what we think sometimes is the end of our troubles, maybe the beginning of our troubles. Matthew 24 speaks to that. We got to get used to the idea that heaven's inspirations may be different than man's revelations. And Jesus is grieving. Why? Because he sees what's happening. They have missed their peace. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees came to Jesus. They said, hey, you're the only one. Your deity, your authority, your omniscient. We can't control the crowd. Would you silence the crowd? Listen to me, friend. Anytime you silence prayer by turning the, uh, the, the, the temple into a merchandise place, which should have been a prayer place. Anytime you silence praise that is rising to Almighty God. Anytime you silence the plan of God, it brings condemnation and judgment on a nation. And Jesus sees it. He's grieving not because... And he's weeping, heaving, and, and sobbing, not because he's happy, but because he sees in these verses what's going to happen. He's the omniscient God that 40 years from that day, there's an enemy is going to come, 70 AD, the Roman Emperor Titus. He's going to do five things. He's going to come around. He's going to surround the city. He's going to build an embankment, which means no food, no water, nothing can come in. He's going to hem that city. He's going to starve it. He's going to, number four, he's going to destroy the people in that city, all ages, children and elderly alike. And that's going to leave nothing. And the stones will cry out that they've missed their day 40 years earlier. Save us. Save us. And Jesus is crying and weeping because he knows what's coming their way. Friend, we need not miss our day of visitation. We need not to cause the heart of God to weep over the fact that we make so much of our preparations for our religious activities, but never make enough preparation for our spiritual awakening. <laughs> That's what we need. And then the last thing I want to share with you, not only the place, the precision, not only the plea, but I want you to see the plan, the plan of God. When Jesus comes, he comes. When the visitation of God happens, it happens either for blessing or for condemnation. When one says no and they silence the voice of God, they bring about condemnation, God weeps. When one says yes, it brings about the blessings of God and it makes heaven rejoice. 
makes heaven rejoice. Have you noticed? I'm almost done. Have you noticed? Since the day they silenced the crowd, they sought to silence the crowd. Since the day they've rejected Jesus, Jerusalem has never been at peace. It's still silent about her Messiah. Now, are the people of Israel, are the Jewish people, God's chosen people? Yes. Are they planned? Is God planning for a future salvation encounter with them? Yes. But for now, Jerusalem is silenced about her Messiah. Jerusalem refused to believe and it's refusing to believe even now. But good news, there's movements in all of Israel right now of young people coming to Jesus Christ. Matthew 24 said, in the last few days, you know, there'll be king against king, nation against nation, people will fight. But then the end is not yet. Why? Why did God wake you up this morning to bring you into the house of God? Here's why. Because at some point in your life, like I did in October 30th, 1984, I recognized the grace of God is reaching out to me. The blood of the lamb is about to cleanse me. I said, yes, I woke up this morning to come to the house of God because I've been bought by the blood of the lamb and there are thousands upon thousands in our region right here in Franklin need the same grace and the same price to be paid that has been paid for their sins save us the plan is to bring redemption to mankind not destruction into their eternal destiny for the next 55 minutes I want to give you three I'm just kidding I'm just let me give you three quick things mark those things down What we see in this passage, number one, is a warning, is a warning for us to receive him. This morning, the saved have gone into apathy and they're feeling something is missing. This morning, the lost is feeling a sense of unease because they don't know what's coming. There's a warning and I believe there's a divine visitation is going to visit our churches and our regions. And we better be looking for a redeemer, not a reformer. A redeemer, not a rebellious leader. And Jesus is going to come. And his sweet anointing is going to cover our churches and our regions. Will we see it or will we miss it? A warning. If your heart today is longing for a true relationship with Jesus Christ, don't wait not one more day. Give him your life. A warning. Invite blessings rather than condemnation. Fadi, is that fear tactics? No, it's really not. It is the fact that when we are saved by the grace of God, the blessings of the Lord will be ours. Our journey may be challenged on earth, but our eternal destiny is sealed. Our citizenship is sealed. Our affection becomes heavenly. We are part of the family of God, the blessings of Almighty God. You with me? Warning. If you're a child of the living God and you're inactive in the move of God today, surrender your life to Jesus. Secondly, He not only gives us a warning in this passage, he also gives us uh, us a a, a watching. We are to be watching. And here it is. Watching for what? Watching for what the Holy Spirit of God is doing all around us. That we may take part of that. We need not fold into our plans, but we need to open up to his supernatural glorious release. And he's releasing something beautiful into the atmosphere. You know why he came in and condemned the church at Laodicea? The word Laodicea literally means the work of man. The work of the hands of man. You know why he did condemn that church? Because they've stopped listening to the Holy Spirit. And they've chosen to go forward with the work of man. And it drove them lukewarm. And God has said, watch. Watch for what my spirit is doing. West Franklin, God is doing a great work all around you. God brought people all around us in Franklin's surrounding places. So he can say, take my plan. Take my weeping. Take my warning. Take my watching. And go to the hearts of those that need me. And bring the blessings of Almighty God into their lives. What a beautiful passage. What a great warning. What a drive for our tears to fall. 
What a beautiful burden God has given us. And we are privileged to live it out by giving our obedience to Almighty God. Let's not quiet praise. Let's not quiet prayer. Let's not, not, not quiet his plans. God is working. Pray with me. Father, I give you praise this morning. I thank you for this encounter that speaks to our soul and to us today. We stand in awe that we are living in those days where Israel has become a nation, where we are part of watching your prophetic declarations come to pass. Lord, would you let your prophecies, Lord, just, just come alive to us that our passion may come through? Lord, would you charge your church with a supernatural mission today to go beyond our religious activity and be an instrument of spiritual awakening? For those, Lord, that need to make a decision to follow you, I pray, I pray today that every stirred soul will not leave this building without declaring Jesus as Lord. And friend, if you don't know Christ as Lord of your life, it's as simple as inviting him into your life. You can say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Be my Lord, be my God. I'm a sinner with a sinful nature. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins, to forgive me of my sinful nature. I yield my life to you. And I'll call you to be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Fadi. Church West Franklin, can we thank Pastor Fadi for being with us this morning? Thank you, Pastor. Would you stand with me? One of the defining things of a life lived with Christ is the fact that you can have peace in every situation and scenario. those moments of surrender like Pastor Friday was talking about can be such a struggle in our flesh, but there is a peace that can surpass understanding. You don't know where it comes from, but it comes from God. When we actually do the thing He's calling us to do, the world would tell us it's unwise or foolish, but there's peace in our soul from following the voice of God that we know. That can define our lives when we walk with Jesus, always attentive to his voice in our life. We're gonna sing this hymn about it being well with our soul. Let this define our life this week as we move on from this place. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my soul go in grace and peace we'll see you next week